Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. Okay, I want to talk to you tonight about uh, something that is critical, I think, to our, our journey, our quest as we move forward. It's all connected to some things that we've already been talking about. Um, I took three weeks to talk to you about crooked lines um, made straight, straight lines in a crooked world. And uh, Chris connected some other things to that last week which I thought were very valuable. But it's all connected to building something within us because um, it's one thing to acquire knowledge, it's a very different thing to, to expose practice to... To hear things and receive things is one thing, but to live them out and be that is, is the more critical thing. Um, who you are is more important than what you know. And, uh, and so I want to continue to talk along certain lines that are, that are connected to um, what we talked about with our uh, um, straight lines in a crooked world and showing the fruit of the Spirit, you know, those things that are up there now, fruit of the Spirit, which are also connected in many ways to 1 Corinthians 13 when it says that, that love is, and it gives you all the things that are, are closely connected to this. So I want to talk to you tonight just for a few minutes about what truly matters. Um, a lot of stuff happens in life, but defining within what happens in life what truly matters is really what... Um, the Song of Songs or the Sol of Solomon is talking about when it talks about wisdom. Wisdom is actually coming to the point where you can decipher within the process of life what truly matters. Because I think it would be true to say that we spend far too much of our time, attention, brain space, uh, emotions, uh, and actions trying to deal with things that in essence don't truly matter that much. They're not the things that really make the difference in life, but we expend our energy because we don't understand what it is that, that truly matters. And I want to cross-link this with something that I've kept regurgitating to you because it's become very important to me, and I think it's significant even more so in our journey forward than it has been in our journey past. And that is this, that when you strip away everything that's just stuff, you're only left with three things. Here's how Paul put it in 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Now these three remain. Now once you use the word remain, it means that stuff has been taken away. Do you get that? Once the word remain is in there, it means when you've taken other stuff away, this is what you're left with. And, uh, and Paul, in all his experience and all that was going on in life, and, and particularly talking to people who have church brains. Uh, and, and in those chapters, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14, he talks about all kinds of things, gifts of the Spirit, prophesying, all kinds of knowledge, and, uh, and, and gifts and ability and flashing sparks from your fingers and all that stuff. And he says, all that's wonderful, and all that has a place. But actually, when you strip away everything that's just stuff, and it might be important stuff, we're not saying that stuff is not important, stuff has importance, but when you strip away everything that really is, in essence, just stuff, you're only left with three things. Now, I like that because a lot of people want life simplifying. Well, I'm going to simplify life for you. Amidst all the stuff, only three things truly matter. And those three things are this, faith, hope, and love. Now, of course, he goes on to say the greatest of these is love. And the reason he does that is to let you know that, that the way this works is not the way it's written. You don't go to faith and from faith to hope and from hope to love. You find love, and when you find love, you go from love to hope. And when you find hope, you go from hope to faith. And that's why he puts that little comment in there that the greatest 
of these is love. Now, I believe that these are the core ingredients that drive and produce everything good. And I believe we are all looking to have produced and to produce that which is good. The secret to producing that which is good and dwelling in a place where good is produced is to stop spending so much energy running after stuff and trying to do stuff better and realize that there is a core to this and the core to this secret of the drive to produce things that are good is faith, hope, and love. And in, in, in reality, we, we look at a lot of subject matters and we consider a lot of things in life, but we probably do too little thinking about faith, we do too little thinking about hope, and we do too little thinking about love. And we are far too able to define things that are not faith and not hope and not love and can get very fuzzy around the edges when we come to the dimension of faith and of hope and of love and not really understand what we mean and therefore be unable to live in those core values that actually are at the core of, of drive and produce of every good thing. Now, uh, when you read the Bible a little bit, some of you should read it a little more. Some people should read it a little less, which sounds a strange thing for a pastor to say. Um, but some people really should, because I don't like it when people are so full of Bible that Bible becomes the grenades that they throw at people to prove that they're right and everybody else is wrong. So for some people, it would do them a world of good not to read as much. For, for, for most of you, it would do you no harm to read a little more and know a little more, and probably the same is true of me. But what you realize as you read the Bible and you look at how this thing called the emerging church, this, this body of people, were developing um, not a new religion because Jesus never came to start a religion, which we've said to you many times. But as they were trying to discover and find and understand what this organic thing that was the kingdom of God now manifesting in humanity was... Um, the prevailing struggle that you see emerging as you read, particularly through the New Testament scriptures of Paul, the writings of Paul, is, is connected to the preservation of practices and beliefs that had formed their previous model of what was essential to believe. And uh, we are a mixed group in here. Some of you have not had a great deal of church background. Uh, others of you have had a lot of church background. And some of us have had a lot of church background. Some of us have known nothing different, like myself. Yeah, you know, I, I've had a real job and I've worked a real job and I've, I've not been a pastor kind of in the bubble because there tends to be a little bubble in some ways. And, uh, but but I, I've been raised in church. I've been raised in church practice. I've watched, I've mimicked, I've learned. And um, in the emerging church, the problem was that as this new thing was developing, was the risk of trying to carry through what people thought it was supposed to be and what they thought ought to happen. And that still happens in, in, in the Christian church today. And uh, the big thing that, that was an argument, one of the, the major things that was an argument was about a thing called circumcision. Now, I haven't got a, I haven't got a video to show you on the screen uh, of circumcision or a little guillotine or anything like that to illustrate my point. Um, but circumcision was a Jewish thing which, which every Jewish boy was circumcised on the 12th day because it was a sign that they were of the seed of Abraham and their Hebrew roots, their Jewish roots, were expressed by the males being, being circumcised. And then along comes Paul and this, this gospel which was always bigger than Judaism and let me say for those of you who understand it, maybe I should, maybe I shouldn't, but I'm going to say it. Anyway, um, the term Judeo-Christian is, is an oxymoron, whatever an oxymoron is, but it sounds like a really good word and it's probably the right one. Um, an oxymoron is something that doesn't really hang together Judaism and Christism, right, don't hang together. Christ came to end what was the core of Jewish practice, which was the law. 
And to say, it's not Moses who you need as your father. It's not Abraham who you need as your father. It's God who you need as your father. And I've come to introduce you to God the Father. And so, do you understand what happens? It's like with us. As we move into new seasons, the danger is we carry through with us what we have known and what we have done and what we did think. And that's what was happening in this emergence of, of, this, of this early thing that became known as, as, as the church, which was the, the ecclesia, the, the, the people of the way. Um, and so this, this issue was, the people who were now being reached weren't circumcised, okay? Now, to the Jewish mind, that meant that you had not confirmed covenant with God, so therefore there was a question of whether you could be a Christian but not circumcised. So without going into a lot of detail... This became, as it always does with people, a big argument because those who were circumcised couldn't understand why those who weren't shouldn't be. And those who weren't couldn't understand why those who were should make them have to be. But it was one of these big arguments that sadly occurs in what's supposed to be a community of love and they're all at one another's throats because, well, you don't pray right, you don't dress right, you don't believe right, you don't interpret the scripture right, you don't, and there's this big fight going on into something that was supposed to be formed out of God so loved the world that he gave. Now, here's the problem, the tendency of humanity is for us to fall into those petty arenas where we fight and squabble over things that don't matter. The problem is we always tend to think it does matter because it matters to us. So if it matters to me, it matters. But not everything that matters to me really matters. Not everything that matters to you really matters. We really do have to get over ourselves in order to come to truth, okay? Now that doesn't mean it shouldn't matter to you, but it might just matter to you. Don't put that on somebody else, okay? So here's what Paul had to say to these people who were arguing, okay, here's the deal, guys, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision or uncircumcision has any value. In other words, in the Gospel of Anth Chapman, I don't flipping care whether you are or you aren't, it doesn't matter. It's just stuff. Now, it might be important stuff, and if you think you should be, go ahead and do it. But Paul said one time, but those of you who go ahead and do it are looking down the nose at everybody else. So here's what the Apostle Paul, in his wonderful spirituality, said, and I'll phrase it in modern English instead of King James English. You people who keep insisting that people can't know God unless they're circumcised like you, I hope when you do it, you cut it off. You go all the way, is what Paul said. He was getting hot under the collar about this whole thing. Because he's making the same point. They had focused on stuff which had some cultural significance and some personal application, but no value. Okay? He says the only thing that counts, now get this, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Now, let, let me just break that down. We have two ingredients there that Paul talks about. Faith and love. Those are the two elements. Um, I think it's, it, it's unfortunate... Sometimes the way words become attached to other words because we begin to interpret them in a different framework than they should be interpreted. For example, the Christian faith. What does that mean? So, so we, what we do is we, we dilute the word faith and make it just something that if you are a Christian, you have. But actually, the Bible doesn't agree with that. That's not a biblical thing, that's a church thing, or the Christian faith. And what it does, it stops us having to evaluate what we really mean by faith, because all people think is, the Christian faith, I believe in Jesus. Which is good, and we should, and we're supposed to, and it's important. 
But faith does not mean believing in Jesus, right? For this thing called salvation. I won't go to hell, I'll go to heaven. So we get a conflict because it devalues the term. Now remember, when you strip away everything that's just stuff, these three remain, and one of them is faith. Faith is something that remains. And of course, the other word there, the other element, is love. Faith expressing itself through love. Let me read you, the guys don't have it on the screen, but let me read you the message version of that verse in Galatians 5 verse 6. For in Christ... Neither our most conscientious religion nor disregard of religion amounts to anything. It is not your conscientious religion or your disregard of religion that amounts to anything. What matters is something far more interior, faith expressed in love. All that counts... The only thing that counts, faith expressed in love. So what I propose to you is that we should then have an understanding of faith which is much more than I belong to the Christian faith or I am a Christian and I have faith because I believe in Jesus. It has to be more than just that. Now, I I propose this this phrase because I think it helps me, I hope it helps you to, to get in the right direction about understanding this thing called faith. Faith, incidentally, is a journey. Faith, faith is not a noun. Faith is a verb. Okay? That's actually true. Faith is not a noun. You understand what a noun is? A noun is just the name of something like chair or speaker or shoe. And we don't pay a lot of attention because it's just the name of something. But faith is actually a noun. A noun is a doing word. Faith is not something that has a name. It's something that you do. And it only is working when you're doing it. Okay? It's not something you have. It's something you do. It's, it's working when you're using it. So I, I, I use this phrase to try and help push us in a certain direction. The journey of faith, because faith is a journey. It's a verb. It's a doing word. The journey of faith is the embracing of a new reality. The the, the whole essence of the Christian faith was the call to people to embrace a new reality, which is why Paul got frustrated when then in embracing the new reality, they were coloring that and corrupting that with what was an old reality that they then wanted to bring through that had actually now become a tradition rather than a revelation. Now always remember that today's revelation is tomorrow's tradition, okay? But the Bible says new every morning are your mercies. We have to be really careful to place value on what is happening to us, but not to place a value that goes beyond the moment, because if we carry that through into another day in something other than gratefulness and thankfulness, very often that becomes a ritual. So today's revelation, to, yesterday's revelation becomes today's ritual. I do what I do because of what happened yesterday rather than because of what's happening today. And throughout Christianity, that has been a problem that as each new revelation has come, it then becomes a ritual and we find ourselves doing things ritualistically. This is how you do it. When actually we're being freed from that and Galatians 5 is all about that. You were set free. Why are you going under a bondage again? So the journey of faith is the embracing of a new reality. So how do I know if I'm doing faith, if I'm verbing faith, if faith is a doing word? I know when I am embracing a new reality. The new reality is the reality that's not the one that you're currently living in. Because the one you're living in is not the new reality, that's the existing reality, the new reality. Remember how we talked about there are two different times, there's your time and God's time, there's your moment, there's God's moment. And it's the same thing with faith. So, so, so faith, when it becomes a verb, draws me to push towards a new reality. So it means that I, I see what is not currently existing. I take hold of what I can't currently 
grasp. I reach for what currently can't be taken hold of. That's what faith is. But listen, if these three remain, faith, hope, and love, then that becomes an essential ingredient of our walk to pull into our world everything good, to drive and produce everything that is good. The journey of faith is the embracing of a new reality. So we could say then that faith is about where we're going more than where we've been. See, I can believe things about things that have already happened because they already happened. So faith is not about where we've been, although where we've been might encourage and stimulate us to believe God for where we are going, but the problem is faith is more about where we are going than where we have been. Now, now here's, here's one of the problems. We tend to spend most of our life looking backwards for the wisdom of how to move forwards. When actually we should spend our lives looking forward for the wisdom to how to evaluate what has happened behind us. So we don't look at the future through the past, we look at the past through the future. God looks back through time, we look forward through time to where he is. So faith is more about where we're going than where we've been. Now, Paul's point was in saying, you're fighting about all this stuff or as Peterson put it in the message, conscientious religion or disregard of religion, but doesn't amount to anything. What matters far more, the only thing that matters is faith expressing itself through love is because he's trying to pull us to the point where rather than fighting, battling, trying to restore and pull back and think things, that we understand faith is more about where we're going than where we've been. Now, here's some important things about faith. It reveals its presence through the words and the spirit that I speak. Um, I don't think any of us pay enough attention to the power of words. We, we certainly don't pay sufficient attention to the creative power that is within words. How many of you know that the, the, the Bible is, is, is full of explanation about word? In fact, we call it the Word of God. Why do we call it the Word of God? Because we are trying to connect within it that somewhere in that collection of writings, somewhere within there in the golden thread, there is something that God is saying and that whenever God says, creation happens. So let me get, take you back to the beginning of the Bible, which has got pretty much nothing to do with how the earth was made in the context of science, but everything to do with how things are made in the context of God and the divine. Okay? So it starts out by giving us a good analogy because we have chaos, we have darkness, we have disorder. And it begins with this amazing thing. It says, and God said... God said, let there be light, and there was light. Where did the light come from? God said, let there be a separation between the waters. Where did it come from? God said, let there be moving things. Where did they come from? They came from the Word, because God said, let there be. In other words, they did not exist before the word was spoken, but when the word to instruct them was spoken, they came into existence. One of the great lessons of Scripture that I wish we grasped much more than trying to fight over creationism or, or all the other, yeah, evolution, creationism, and all that stuff, is to understand the great significance of those statements is that words create, and God has given within words the power to create. I don't think we have understood the power that we have in our tongue, in our mouth, to create. Now, here's the interesting thing. Um, in the Hebrew language, breath and spirit are the same word, ruach. You could also say the same for, um, in the Greek, which is, which, which is um, pneuma. 
Pneuma is breath. Pneuma is spirit. So breath and spirit are a synonymous word. Hebrew and Greek, synonymous word. Here's the reason, because in breath there is spirit. Now here's the illustration I like to use. You cannot speak without breathing. It's impossible. If I told you to take a deep breath and hold your breath and then ask you to say my name, you couldn't do it because you can only speak as you breathe. You see, even in that is the power that says when we speak, there is ruach, there is pneuma, there is spirit, because breath and words are connected together. So when God speaks, he breathes, and when he breathes, it's his spirit, and when his spirit happens, creation happens. Faith is connected to that process, and I want to show you from Scripture how that is true. So we reveal the presence or not of faith through the words and the spirit that I speak. Creation is a word-saying oriented discipline. Remember as well John chapter 1, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was made flesh. God in the flesh is the word incarnate, okay? It's a creative process. But here's what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 13. And since we have the same spirit of faith, spirit of faith, pneuma of faith, breath of faith, word of faith, since we have the same spirit of faith that Jesus had, according to what is written, listen to what he said, I believed and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak. So faith has a dual process. It has believing and speaking. You don't separate the two. Faith is not a private activity that you have at home. Faith is a public activity that we express. I believed, therefore I spoke. Now, what's interesting is that we may try to mask it, but when you really get down to it, most of us speak what we believe. And often the problem is those are not creative, energy-empowered words. Very often they are neutral or negative words which don't create something good and positive and powerful in our lives. But Paul says, if faith is important, which it is, it's more than stuff. And if all that remains and what's important is faith expressing itself through love, That faith means that in that same spirit, according to what is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. So we believe and we speak. We believe and we speak. Where does our belief come from? Because that's what we're going to speak and how do we work on that belief? So let's move on to another thing and we'll tie this together just as we finish. So these three remain. Faith, hope, and love. So what is hope? Have we thought enough about hope? I've tried to define hope to you as the confident expectation that the last word has not yet been spoken. And we could talk a lot about that definition, and I think it's a good definition, but I'm not going to hang there today, um, partly because of time. We'll deal with some more elements of hope at another time. But this is what's important about, about hope. Hebrews 6 verse 19 says, We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Hope is what anchors your soul. Now you know that when a ship doesn't have an anchor, it drifts on every tide and gets swept by every current. Have you ever wondered why you get the drifting process and why you seem to get swept by every current? I'll tell you why. Because you don't have hope. Because hope is what anchors the soul. That's why hope is important. That's why hope is put in there and to some degree has become the poor relation because we think faith, yes, love, yes, but hope. You know, isn't hope kind of the poor man's faith kind of thing? You know, you shouldn't just be hoping, you should have faith. No, hope is critical to our life. It's one of those three things. It is a critical element that we need to have 
because hope is the anchor for the soul. It's what anchors what's going on in here. And it has a great deal to do with how you feel and how you respond is the level of hope that you have. Once you lose hope, according to Hebrews 1 verse 1, which says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, and the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Once you lose hope, according to Hebrews 1 verse 1, faith has no viable material to work with. So here's my point. Often we are trying to be people who, who have faith, but we can't have faith if we don't have hope because faith has no viable material to work with unless it has hope. Faith is the substance of what? Things hoped for. Faith makes substance of what we hope for. So if we are hopeless, whatever we think faith is, it's probably not. Because faith will ride on the hope that we have because hope is the raw material that faith takes a hold of and says, now I'm going to turn that hope into substance. Now I like that because I can ask you, not just what are you believing for, because that might frighten some of you, but I can say, what are you hoping for? And I've expressed to you before that there are two kinds of hope. For most of us, you say, hoping I don't finish up in hospital, hope I don't die young, Hope I don't get the sack. Hope I have enough money to pay the bills. How many of you know that's not really the hope that the Bible's talking about? We made something that's incredibly positive into a negative that our hope as we define it tends to be the, de the, 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 the declaration or the confession that we live one step from failure. You know, when you say, I hope I'm not going to die from this, you are declaring, I am one step from failure. When you say, I hope I'll have enough money to pay the bills, you're declaring, I'm one step away from the bailiffs. That's not the kind of hope. In fact, it says about Abraham, it says, Abraham in hope, against hope, believed. What was he against? The hope that says, I hope this works out. I hope it's going to be okay. Because it says, Abraham refused to believe that his body was as good as dead but embrace the promise of God that said there's something beyond this. Or in other words, faith to Abraham was the embracing of a new reality beyond where he was currently living. Faith is no viable material to work with without hope. Once hope is lost, faith cannot be present, which is why it's faith, hope, love. But there's also another factor here that in the absence of love... Hope has no viable material to work with. Which is another interesting thought to think that the end product of faith is connected to hope, but hope is connected to love, and that if hope is the raw material with which faith works, love is the raw material with which hope works. If you don't believe that you are loved, if you don't love yourself, if you don't love others in a relationship, you begin to be hopeless. Isn't it fascinating how the English language has developed that we call somebody who's rubbish at stuff hopeless? Oh, you're hopeless at that. Because we have attached to hopelessness the sense of failure, the sense of of, of, of self-abasement, of putting oneself down. Oh, I'm, we mean by hopeless, I'm a failure, when actually hopeless doesn't mean you're a failure. Hope just means that you've not had hope rise up in you. And the reason hope is not rising up in you is because there is a love deficiency. And the first two love deficiencies are understanding how much God loves you. Don't please, 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 let me free you from the bondage of feeling that God's relationship with you is dependent upon how much you love him. Nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing. And no matter how much you become able to love God, it will never enhance the love of God to you one little bit. It will not change the love of God. God loves you truly in spite of, and he loves you because of. Now, one of the other damaging statements in 
in, in Christian terminology as being God loves you in spite of, which means you're rubbish, you're not up to much, you don't get anything right, you're a pretty pitiful example of humanity, but God loves you in spite of all that. Oh, wonderful. Try and build a relationship like that. Try and build a relationship by saying, hey, I love you in spite of who you are, in spite of what you look like. See, here's the wonderful miracle when you understand this in hope. God loves me because of who I am. Not because of what I do, but he loves me because of who I am. Because Anne Chapman is precious in God's sight. Eunice Craven is precious in God's sight. God doesn't primarily love Eunice Craven in spite of. He loves Eunice Craven because of. He loves Eunice because she's Eunice. And she's unique and she's made. And God said, I love Eunice Craven. She's amazing. She doesn't always do everything right. Right? And that's where the in spite of comes in. The in spite of is about do, not about who. God loves me in spite of what I do, but he loves me because of who I am. Do you understand that? Which is powerful. You look in the mirror and able to say, God loves me because I'm me. And so this love deficiency begins with understanding how much God loves you and allowing that love to be a reality, not fighting that love, not arguing with the one who loves you, which is not wise. And then what that does, that allows you to love you a little more. It doesn't mean you love everything about you, and it doesn't mean you love everything that you do, but actually at the core, you can actually give yourself some value because, listen, you can't love others if you don't love you. Now listen, love your neighbor as what? Love your neighbor as what? So if you don't love yourself, how are you going to love your neighbor? Deficiently. You're going to treat your neighbor like you treat yourself. You're going to believe about your neighbor what you believe about yourself. But when you believe I'm loved by God and he loves me because of who I am and in spite of what I do, you love your neighbor because of who they are and in spite of what they do and the whole thing becomes faith expressing itself through love. I want to free you from a state of hopelessness. Hopelessness is the most horrible thing means you wake up on a morning, you just can't see how things are ever going to work out, how life's going to figure, how things are ever going to progress. Uh, you know, stuck on, the, on, the, on the, the wheel, just here we go again. But hope changes all that. So once you lose sight of love, hope cannot be present. So I want to encourage you tonight not to strive to be a man or a woman of faith but to rest in the love that is yours. And begin there. Begin there. Okay? Begin there. Because when you know you love, what happens? You, you suddenly have hope that things could actually get better. Things might actually change. Because I'm loved. And, and when you know who loves you, the hope gets even bigger. It's a bit like somebody being reconnected with a parent that they were separated from at birth and realizing now that parent is a billionaire and you've lived in poverty wondering how you would never get you'd ever get your next meal only to find when you find the one that loves you that they're a billionaire and they have everything that could possibly be needed to meet your need and all of a sudden hope starts to rise in your heart because you realize who your daddy is. Listen, when you start realizing truly who your daddy is, hope will rise in your heart. You are not stuck. You are freed. Hope will rise in your heart when you come to this place. So once you lose sight of love, hope cannot be present. But once you get a sight of this love, hope will begin to rise. And when hope begins to rise, guess what? Faith begins to make substance of the things that we hope for. And how does it do that? I believed, it is written, I believe, therefore I've spoken. And so we believe and therefore speak. But it's not some picking a Bible verse out and saying, I'm going to believe this and speak this. It comes from the love that produces the hope that's coming from daddy that then lets the faith get a hold of that and the faith begins to speak, to breathe, to spirit... 
And we have to get back to understanding that in those words, in that speaking, there is creative power to change things. Just making sense. So let, let's, let's finish this off. We're, we're done for time. I believe that all this is the reason why Jesus, in essence, said that the only commandment that truly matters. So we've got a lot of onlys. All, the only thing that matters is faith expressing itself through love because love causes the hope to rise and hope makes the faith. I begin to speak that through. And, and, and the faith does what we said earlier. The faith causes me to embrace a new reality. And we talked about these three remain. When you remove everything that's just stuff, faith, hope, and love. And then along comes Jesus and says, a new commandment I give to you, right? A new commandment. A new commandment. Now, let me just take one step back and then two steps forward to finish. Uh, many people will tell you, which incidentally I absolutely believe is incorrect, that, the, that what we should live by is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Let me tell you why. That's not what we've got to live by, because you can't do it. I dare anybody to say, I have loved the Lord God with all my heart, mind, and strength. You can't do it. It's a do. It's a do. And the wonderful thing, uh, why the gospel is called good news, because it's not a do, right? It's not a do. Why the law is called destructive, because the law is a do. And in the law, it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart. Do it. You can't. Even the first commandment, you can't do it. Just give it up. Just give it up now. Stop the fight. You can't do it. And then he says, and if you've done that, now love your neighbor as yourself. So in words some might not like, but some will understand, you are screwed. Which is why Jesus comes along and people think Jesus was reiterating because he said the greatest commandment, the greatest of the commandments was love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, strength, love your neighbor as yourself. He was right. The greatest of the commandments, the old law, what you had to do with those. But I want you to notice something. What is the one word that invades all of that that was even the most important thing in the old covenant? Love. Love the Lord your God. Love your neighbor. Love, love, love. And so he comes through and said, look, even in the law, the greatest thing you can do is love your neighbor. Love your neighbor. Love your... It's all about love, even in the old covenant. But what he was showing in that old law was you can do your best, but you ain't going to succeed because the love you have has to come from a different criteria than performance. And it's this. So Jesus said, is the deal, guys, a new commandment I give you. John 13, 13. 34. That you love one another, and people are thinking, yeah, we've heard this, but not as you love yourself, but you love one another as I have loved you, and that's how you also love one another. You see, the model he's giving is the one that I have given you, that you have to learn to live in the love that God has for you. He loves you because of and then he loves you because of who you are, but in spite of what you do. Because of who you are, in spite of what you do. Because of who you are, in spite of what you do. Because the doing will surely mess things up. So he's taken that out of the primary role in the event and says, I love you because of who you are. And so Jesus said, this is the new commandment that I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. So what's the measurement for loving one another? The same way that we are loved by God. You're only going to do that if the love you've experienced brings a hope in you and that hope produces a faith. And then in faith, you will love. In faith, you will love life. In faith, you will love the world. In faith, you will love in the midst of your circumstances. In faith, you love even when the storm is happening because it started in the right place. Now, let me finish by saying this because... There's more to build on this. I believe these three elements are key to our future and the quest that we are on. Faith, hope, love is what we're focusing on. Us being people of faith, hope, love. Us expressing faith, hope, love. Us bringing people to a place of faith, hope, and love. Because what people need for the life that they're looking for, for the world to work, is faith, hope, love. Not all the other stuff. 
that we try to put on people, not all the religious nonsense, not all the do's, but we want people to have some faith come up in their heart. We want people to have a sense of hope when they come in here. I want people to feel loved, not just by us, but by the Father. So let me finish with this, John 13, 35, the next verse. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. What kind of love? The love that springs from the understanding of how I am loved, that then is how I love, is the whole basis for this working. But I want to ask you a question. If by all this, or if by this, the expression of our love for one another, I don't mean Facebook friendship, I don't mean you know followers on Twitter, I mean the genuine, unbreakable, the, 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 the love that, that, that pervades itself with hope and, and, and works through faith for all of us, that binds us together. It said, by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So I have this question to finish with. Whose disciple are you? Whose disciple are you? How did Jesus say discipleship is measured? In that you have love, one for another. That's how people will know that you are my disciples. See, we can be disciples of religious practice. We can be disciples of our upbringing, our background, our theology, our worldview. But Jesus said there's one measure that shows that you're my disciples. And it's measured by your expressed love, your outworked love, how we be with one another all the time. Because love binds us when it's this kind of love. It binds us together with an unbreakable bond that feeds that hope because we have a wonderful hope that is being expressed by faith that's taking hold of that hope and that produces creative words that we breathe out. I, I want to encourage you tonight that when we're his disciples in this way, we have the power to change things as we begin to speak from that love, that hope, that faith that is coming us. The same power that created the world is the same power that flows out of us because it was God who breathed into Adam the breath of life and Adam was then breathing like God breathes. And as he breathed out, he had a power. And the kingdom of God is a kingdom of power for that reason. And I want you to live in it. Whose disciple are you? Let me tell you how you work that. You come back to ask the question, what is it that truly matters? What truly matters is faith, hope and love, and the greatest is love. And as we embrace that, walk in that, and become doers of that, out of the fact of who we be, then we do. Remember, you are a human being, not a human doing. First and foremost, you are a human being. It is who you be that is important. And out of who you be comes what you do. The problem with what we do is always based in we don't know who we be. And the whole gospel is, is when you know who you be, then it changes what you do. So God's not trying to change what you do. He's trying to change who you be. And he changes who you be by inviting you into this wonderful love. I think it's amazing. God loves you because of who you are, Steve. That's good, isn't it? He loves you because of who you are. And in spite of what you do, but he loves you because of who you are. Top of the list. Loves Anth because of who I am. He loves me in spite of what I do, but top of the list is he loves me because of who I am. He loves you because of who you am. When you grasp this, this process starts to work, and you become again a human being breathed in by the breath of God, so that then you do from who you be. Let's just pray. Father, help us to grasp this. Help us to live in this. Help us to let faith be a verb in our lives 
and not a noun. Let hope arise because we see your love and we thank you for how great the love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God and that is absolutely what we are. Help us to walk in this and live in it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk And why not support the rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.